It's the My Michelle Live podcast. My Michelle Live Sports Time Out. The fans, the field, the faith, the fun. Here's Michelle. I love that. The fans, the field, the faith, the fun, and the fellas, my brothers, and my friends. We're taking on sports. It's a sports roundtable show where we look at the sports news of the week, some of the exciting things to talk about, some of the underlying stories that all in one way or another kind of point to something bigger, and that's what we call the God story. Let me introduce you to the roundtable, and as it is with this show, sometimes guys will pop in, sometimes guys will pop off, but, and sometimes they'll sound We're always popping off. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, but joining us in the fun today, we have Brent R. Baker. Photographer Brent R. Baker. And then another author and sports reporter, and man, he is, he covers those Bengals, and it is an exciting time of the year. We're going to get a little inside into our f- friend Dell. Dell, did we? Guys, thank you so much for joining us and hanging out with us today. It is a uh, playoff season. I'm pretty excited. Eagles with a 15-3 and 49ers with a 15-4 record. Pretty exciting. They have, they're pretty much neck and neck actually for their winning and losing. And then we have the Chiefs. Who are they playing? Who they? (laughs) Who they? Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, so Eagles, 49ers, Bengals, Chiefs. So we're going to get, we're down to the final four and then to the big Super Bowl, the biggest sporting event in the United States of America. Who will be the final two? Let's talk about it. So, Del, as a Bengals reporter, and you just can't help but being a fan, first of all, let's talk. You and I are in the booth a lot, in the media booth mm-hmm. a lot for, for games. And how hard is it when you have to be professional and you're watching this stuff take place and you just want to get into fan mode? It's tough. How do you deal with that? I have a lot of food in front of me, so I have my mouth full <laughs> typically a lot, so I can't yell out. But they always give the little spiel before the game. This is a working pretty press box. Blah, blah, blah. You can't do that. You refrain from cheering. But did, somebody did last week. We don't know who it was. Somebody did that let out a big yoop real, real loud when there was a certain play. I don't know what happened. I don't think anything happened. But they now, don't the only squirt we, you out or anything. I've yeah, they'll just come over and say, hey, keep it down. Or <laughs> you shouldn't do that. We don't do that. We said, I sat with the same core people every game and we're rooting for them. We want them to do well, but we're not. We're not. Now, that did happen last year in Kansas City when. The Bengals won to go to the Super Bowl. We all we all cheered. What are they going to do? Throw us out? Then the game was over. <laughs> <laughs> and speaking of food, this is another inside look. Which you mean you've been all over? Which stadium serves the best food? It comes down to D- D- Dallas and Buffalo. Those two are just phenomenal. Dallas, come on. Oh, and we have okay food up here, but you get into, I'm actually not eat, eating in the Buffalo Stadium, but Dallas. Oh, man, it was good. Dallas had for the pregame meal, they had prime rib, and then for the halftime meal was brisket. What? Good. Good yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Same thing with Buffalo. Yeah, I, Buffalo had we had brisket before the game, and then during the game, halftime they had wings and all that kind of. So it was good. Okay, and so I'm gonna launch my nominee for the worst stadium food, and that's up in Vancouver, BC, as I watch the Whitecaps there, Rogers Stadium. Worst. It's always some kind of vegan this and these soggy, awful hamburgers like you had in the cafeteria line at school. Really bad. How about it? It's, I don't pay for it, so I can't complain too much about it. But You no. don't. No? Okay, make me feel bad. Come on. The worst one, though. No. The worst out of the NFL, so far, all the teams have been so I've been to most of them. Cleveland needs some work. <laughs> oh, on so many levels. I won't even yeah. touch that, my friend. I won't even touch that. All right, Brent, who is your pick for the Super Bowl? Who's going to win this weekend? One of the things that makes picking these games tough 
is we're not entirely sure what the health is of two of the four quarterbacks between Patrick Mahomes' high ankle sprain for the Chiefs and then how healthy Jalen Hurts is for the Eagles. Those are wild cards because if both of those are fully, I would pick the Chiefs and I would pick the Eagles, and they're also both playing at home. You've got that going on too. But they Um, also have the that it factor that we like to talk about of you can have an inferior team, but man, if everything just lines up and they have that inner it factor – the you've seen the underdog come out on top so that's yeah. what makes there's, there's sports not, i don't think there's yeah i don't think there's a true underdog in either of these surely not so far joe burrow's three and zero against the homes if i'm not yeah. am i right yeah yes. so for the bengals mm-hmm. to go into kansas city and win would not be a huge mm-hmm. upset but I also think Patrick Mahomes seems not to get ruffled by a whole lot, but I think there's been some talk this week about maybe the Bengals are the team now and maybe Burrow's better than Mahomes. And I don't care who you are, that, that's that got to sit in the back of your mind a little bit. At the same time, the Bengals have really gotten on a roll. I'm going to go with I'm going to go with the Chiefs but just by hair and no shock if it goes the other way. And Philadelphia and San Francisco, yeah, it's another tough one. I think across the board, I think that, the Niners have edges at several positions. However, as much as I like what Brock Purdy has done as Mr. Irrelevant and third string quarterback coming on midway through the season, I think Jalen Hurts is the difference in this game. So I'm going to go with the Eagles. But man, if Purdy and the 49ers win, that's an all-time story. And not shocking either because of just you've got guys like McCaffrey and Bosa and the 49ers that are two of the best players in the league. But I'm going to go with an Eagles... Chiefs Super Bowl, but there's. <laughs> if I were a betting man, I don't think I'd bet on these games. I'm not, <laughs> and I. If someone were to ask me who's going all the way, who's who is going to come out on top, I'm just a, let's sit back and see. I don't yeah. have a horse in this race, and I love that because <laughs> I can just watch and enjoy. I don't need a defibrillator standing by. I've been there. We've all been there. Dell, anything to contribute there? Yeah, a couple of things. I'll give you my pick as a fan, and then I'll give you my pick as okay. <laughs> then my objective pick. My fan pick wants to see the Bengals and the 49ers because of the history of that, of as two Super Bowls in the past. And Brent did say something pretty good about Mahomes playing really well. In the, cl- the last three games he's played against Cincinnati, for some reason, and, I've, and I was at all those, in the second half, he got rattled every game. And during the AFC Championship last year, he took two sacks down by the goal line that he just scrambled and ran around and then took a sack. Then oh, he yeah, did yeah. the same thing again. He had back-to-back plays of like negative 29 yards. And he threw a <clears> he threw <throat> pick. And this past year, he got he didn't play well in the second half. So I don't know what, what happens there, but the Bengals seem to rattle him. And so as a fan, that's who I'd love to see, objectively speaking, um, I think it's going to be the same result. I think you're going to see the Bengals 49ers play in that Super Bowl. And was one of the few people up there Sunday. We all talk amongst themselves. Who do you like? Who do you think? Blah, blah, blah. And I was like one of one of or two of seven that said the Bengals are going to pull this out. And they just didn't pull it out. They beat them. They yeah. dominated Buffalo. Well, additionally, I think they are still on that high. I really do. I think that getting into the playoffs, their last win, I think yeah. all of that contributes to that it factor of yeah. we, we've got this and the enthusiasm of the fan base. That is nothing to sneer at. But we also have some announcements for finalists for MVP yeah. and such. So I'd like to talk about some of our favorite picks. Any <laughs> thoughts? <clears throat> Yeah, I'll start. I think it'll go to Hurts. He's earned. I think they, they they all could legitimately win that. I think uh, I think Jalen gets that because they've just been so good all year long, all year long. Whereas the Bengals struggled in the first part of the season, zero and two, zero and three in the conference at one point. So they went down and up, and the, but the Eagles have come out of the gate and not stopped. So that's only the reason. I would either think it's either going to be Jalen or us Burrow. Those are my I think in that order. Okay, Brent. Yeah, I actually, <laughs> I'm going to go with Justin Jefferson of the Vikings. Yeah. Um, yeah. Just yeah. because, first of all, it's like, it always seems to go to the quarterback. And yeah. 
it almost to me seems like there should be a separate category for the quarterback because I the agree. quarterback I is, was say is that. like the most, most important position in all the sports. But I also think when you look at the Vikings and yeah. the fact that they had the, what the three seed in the NFC with the defense that they did, which wasn't that great, but some of the plays that Jefferson made, some of the numbers he put up, I am not anti Kirk Cousins with the Vikings, but I think Jefferson made his season look a lot better than it might have been otherwise. Yeah. And some of the plays he made and some of the situations he made them in, that game at Buffalo midseason, which is like one of the best games you'll ever want to see, one of the craziest games. I mean, he made maybe one of the all-time best catches in the mm -hmm. NFL, given what he did on the play and the situation. It was something like fourth and 18 and final couple minutes yeah. of the game. So I'm going to go with him. I would put Burrow a close second behind him, and then I'd go with Hertz. Yeah. I really do like that. I, that was one of the comments I wanted to make is uh, and ask you guys about was the uh, having the separate category because I almost think that the, the outcome is much like America. There's some of us who are crazed fans and we know the nuances and we appreciate every player on the field and their athleticism, but most people just watch the quarterback. It's like being back in high school. He's he's always the homecoming king. It feels that way with MVP and I think maybe a separate category might be in order. Hey, some other news from the NFL. They are beyond the finalists and all of that exciting stuff. Another announcement from Dallas. They are making some big staff changes following the loss to the 49ers. And, and that's pretty big to see that kind of... But yeah. what was crazy is this has been a crazy week throughout sports with staff changes and some coaching shuffles. Ernie Stewart, Brian McBride leave the U.S. US men's soccer team. Greg Berhalter is, has some big scandals. And soccer's more Garrick's and I's focus. So I've been following this. But that's a pretty interesting to watch the U.S. men's national team. They just had a 2-1 loss to Serbia. They have all these coaching stuff and that crazy stuff going on with Bert Holter. 20 years ago, he had an altercation with the woman who's now his wife. Uh, some of the the comments on the board were like, I stole candy from a candy store when I was 5, 20, 30 years ago. I just want to get this out now and get ahead of the story before I'm canceled. Domestic violence is no small thing, but we are talking drunk kids, underage drinking, it looked like, 20, 30 years ago. What the heck? Just a reminder to me what it's going to be like 20 to 30 years from now with people when you have all of this stuff on that they Ooh. videoed and put it on social media and, you know, we don't I even mean, think about that because we're we're a little, we didn't grow up know. we didn't grow up with that danger it's like an embarrassing picture gets taken when you're in college you find the negatives and throw them away now it's like thank out god forever. all the stupid stuff <laughs> i've done in my life is not part of the social media network but also this goes even weirder it's like a soap opera that Gio Reyna was on the u.s men's national team the coach said yeah he wasn't playing and he had a bad attitude mom got really ticked and threatened to share these allegations about burr they've known each other because she was a, a soccer player she knew she really with his wife and the sad thing to me that no one's really talking about is that this kid this kid Gio knew this family he's got to be like an uncle to him and then you have all of this drama it is so ugly that's the that's sometimes the price you pay when you look at fame fortune and success and it is really sad another coaching change up on I'm going to go through a few of these and let you guys weigh in the Canucks and this was seemed to be another an instance where the press gets it wrong go figure and there's been some instances but the Canucks fans for example Rick Tache is now the new coach for the Canucks right and they have had such a bad season they let their old coach go when he came on, fans were booing, and he laughed it off, and he said, they just know my middle name's Lou. So I was at the game where they played the Seattle Kraken. They got their butts handed to them by the Kraken, and that big story there, great. Okay, good for them. Kraken making history, first win over the Canucks. But the fans were yelling, Bruce, there it is. Bruce, there it is, talking about their 
old coach. And the press was reporting, yeah, the Seattle fans were mocking. It wasn't the Seattle fans. It was the Canucks fans that were yelling, Bruce, there it is. I was there amongst the fans. Now, the reason why that's an interesting story is that there is some unsettled fans out there. And we don't really <laughs> always talk about it. It's We talk about what's going on in the head office, but sometimes not what's going on in the fan base. Guys, weigh in on some of these. if you. The only thing I'll say is about some fans I saw this past weekend up in Buffalo. Buffalo was, was very hospitable to us. But they're very dedicated fans. Now, I didn't see anything out of the ordinary, but at 10 o'clock in the morning, I'm going to the game at 10 a.m., right, the 3.30 game. And above the stadium sits in, in like a little village, so it's not out off of an interstate. It's in a little two-way street, so it's KB500. You're in the middle of a little town, so traffic's backed up forever. So I get there at 10 o'clock thinking oh, it's a good move, and it was. But as I was getting in near the stadium, again, it was like 24 degrees at 10 o'clock in the morning. I saw seven or eight guys walking down the street with their mm. bills hat on and shorts that was it and they're carrying a lot of adult beverage with them but it's 10 a.m and they're no and here's shirtless guys in 24 degrees oh my Woo! gosh those are unsettled fans <laughs> <laughs> and not only yeah, the, go ahead brent oh, i was gonna say uh, with the <clears throat> vancouver coaching situation i think when you have a front office that handles things well it's easy yeah. to take it for granted because you, they don't end up in the news all the time. Man, mm, yeah. whatever's going on in Vancouver is just bizarre because they slow walked Bruce Boudreaux's firing for weeks. He knew, everyone knew he was going to be out the door, but they wouldn't do it. So he continued to coach through that. I think they even had in the press the hiring of, of, of however you say Rick's last name. <laughs> um, yeah. I think they. it was announced in the press that he'd been hired before Boudreau was even told he was fired. And Boudreau didn't even have a losing record during his time with the team. The Canucks right. are not having a good season, but he took over midstream last year and almost got them to the playoffs when they were in a pretty bad spot. Mm. So the whole well, thing Rick is Well, Rick had his bizarre. first win, but his second win, or his second game was to Seattle, and Seattle yes. just spanked them. It was like... Six one in the end, and by the way, the can problem, I just the problems there are not coaching. It's everything else. And Seattle's on fire. They are just that's on it. fire, and it's really fun to watch. But that's not the only thing that has fans unsettled, and it's refereeing. <laughs> so let's take that on. First of all, now the yeah. NFL announced this week, Dell, that the Carl Sheffers will be the team, will be the referee team for the Super Bowl. And that's going to happen next month, of course. And that, they say, is bad news for the fan base because some of us just hate seeing penalties impact the game. I'm going to get your comment first, uh, Dell, in just a moment. But there are some other stories, too. The Warriors got away with a crazy foul in the final seconds when they were playing Golden State. And the final score was 122 to 120 over the Memphis Grizzlies. Now, that Wednesday game at Chase Center had a last minute foul that oops I couldn't see it oh I'm so sorry that was crazy and fans should be real fans get irate at that especially when bad calls affect the game and in this age I'd like to get your thoughts on the NFL both of you we'll start with Dell with yeah. bad calls and in this age of technology I don't mind having refs on the field but should we really protect the game by utilizing technology better with VAR and video with video review. And some, they have people in New York looking over stuff. Should we be better? Yeah. Yes. And no, this is, this has been a, I've had a difference of opinion for a long time on this because I've written several columns about it. You understand the instant replay. And I like that, but I don't like it when a referee misses a call. But I don't like it when my favorite receiver drops a pass. They don't get a do-over. They don't get to go back and, hey, let me have another shot at that one. So I don't like the so human So you nature. see the ref as, a, as a, another player on the field, so to speak. That's part of the game. I think it's part of the game. And I do the limits they put on, on, on replay, like in baseball. I understand because there's been, for that home run ball to see whether it goes over the top, if that was in or out, fair or foul, I see some of those things. 
but I don't see if they miss a call or get it wrong. That's part of it. I just, I'm old school that way. I don't like to see that. And referees today, they are getting hammered. And I wouldn't want to be a referee. And the core that's going to be there, as you mentioned, they are they are flag crazy. Not flag crazy, but they throw a lot of flags. Well, so we it, know what to expect. Yeah, yeah, it's a real tough one. Yeah, I don't like it when the kicker misses a field goal. And no, they don't get a do-over. No. But they're playing for their team. And sometimes yeah. you just wonder if there's bias that comes in in, in refing. That, oh, yeah, there is. And that's not okay. And that's w- yeah. where I'd like to have protections in place, Brent. Yep. First of all, I kind of lean towards Dell's position here as far as you can have too much replay. One of the things that bothers me is like when you have a replay delay of five or 10 minutes when they're going frame by frame to try to figure out if a guy really caught the ball or not. Back when replay first started, and they still use this phrase, call shouldn't be reversed unless it's something is clear and obvious. Yes, and if it to takes me, five minutes, me, it's not. To me, if you can't tell in 30 seconds if it's right. clear and obvious, then let the call on the field stand. Yep. Now, that said, I, what I would do to improve it, we've seen it recently more in the NFL where, like, you don't even see a team challenging a play. Half the time, there will be, like, somebody from New York will talk into the referee's ear, and they'll say, well, after consult- consultation, the pass is incomplete. So if you have that going on where you're able to make a change to a clear and obvious error, that without, like, slowing yes. the game down for hours, that's great. Yep. Yes, but the other thing yes. I like, I, I don't watch a lot of the NBA, but one of the things the NBA does that I wish the NFL would do more of is after every game, they will do an assessment. They'll do a press release of re- officiating errors that were made like in the last four or five minutes of the game. And so yeah. there's a lot more public accountability there. Exactly. Whereas the NFL, NFL, a lot of times you mm-hmm. won't hear anything from the league right. or you might hear something from an official but as far as the league saying, nope, this call was wrong. And Brent, do you know what bothers us about that? It's like following the whole COVID stuff and the things that had happened in the last three years. Yeah. Officials come out and say something and then they change their mind and no one follows up. It's nope, nope, that they, we never said anything before. It just reminds us all of that. It's if you make a mistake, oops, I'm sorry, here's what I did. In fact, the NBA confirmed yeah. that the refs missed what could have been an important and call on Thompson's three-pointer. So that was good for them. We like a little bit of accountability. And in, in, I mentioned the NHL. I love hockey. One funny thing is it's kind of tradition that when the refs come out at the beginning of the game, skate on the ice, everyone, boo-boo, in our more blue state, blue area of Seattle, people who are new to hockey, it's a new team, two years, right? 32nd team of the NHL, the Seattle Kraken. People are like, oh, you're booing. That's so bad. We can't do that. You'll hurt someone's feelings. And you're like, dude, it's hockey. Hockey hurts not only feelings, broken teeth, and we cheer when people fight. It's, It's a different kind of animal that the U.S. is still maybe even getting used to, if I might say. But... Yeah, seriously. So they boo the refs. But I'm wondering now, as I'm in support of how hockey does their stuff, and I like it, it's fine. But now I'm starting to feel like the blue people, right? (laughs) Because Uh. here are some news stories with refs. Refs are now, especially in lower levels of sports, is in, are in short supply. They say they're aging, and these refs are aging out. There's poor sportsmanship from players and parents. At least 50,000 of, ref, of the referees across the nation have quit since the pandemic, one of the issues, like poor parent behavior, they was a was a news report in the Houston Chronicle, and in New Jersey, they are stiffening penalties for assaulting refs in youth sport. One of the issues was a coach that punched a 72 year old umpire during a youth baseball game last June for uh, after arguing a call. This is getting really crazy so while i get really ticked off when refs miss a call and we'll yell out and yeah i'm aggressive you might think you guys for some reason think i'm a nice person but you probably haven't <laughs> sat next to me during a sporting <laughs> i think so most of my my high or my sports 
reporting career was covering high school sports. And yeah. I did see a lot of, I guess, de-evolution of parental behavior during that time. <laughs> and it's even gotten worse post-pandemic. To me, I think where the line gets drawn is where it becomes personal. I think anyone who signs up to ref, even some of the, when you have high school kids, it's one thing to have like people just like booing a call from the stands. If you're at a Kraken game, you're yelling at the refs, you're booing calls, whatever. The refs, it's part of the job, right? But when you start getting having person-on-person -person confrontations, when you start having physical altercations, when you're calling people out by name, when you're making your you're, it's not booing. It's, oh, I found out that referee just got a divorce. So I'm going to start yelling things at him about his ex-wife or whatever. When you, there, there are, there is acceptable rules of context, con, conduct in your, your displeasure with officiating calls. Okay. So why I, are you we know, going so, here? You know, What's going on? Let's look down deeper. We look for the God story, the deeper story. What's going on here? <laughs> just rebellion. Okay. Just, <laughs> just rebellion. Boom. Call it like it is. They don't like rules. They don't like the people who make, who enforce the rules, who call, who make the plays. So I think it's just all. That's We're what selfish. It is. We want. I can remember we this. Want things our way. Yeah. When I was a player, even a coach years ago, we had instances then, and so it's always going to be a part of the game. But I think it is getting a little bit more violent, though. It is, and we are taking what's going on in our world our nation and in our hearts whether it's rebellion as you point out or you, we are so self-important and how i feel about things is the only thing that matters and it becomes our driving force it becomes our religion yeah what's odd and what not odd is funny to me is we'll be sitting up in the booth you've been there we'll see fans near us we can't really we're not we're inside but we can see them standing up yelling they're, like they're going to hear this guy who 200 yards away and the crowd's roaring he's screaming at the you know, like that ref will stop the game and said i hear you aren't we right. self-important and really yeah. and it leads me to the last news item i wanted to take on it's also what we're going to be facing uh, face off, off. <laughs> Yep, we're going to face off on this one. So the this is my neck of the woods, and it's become a big story. Uh, the Seattle Sounders, our Major League Soccer team, has a new sponsor. It's Providence. It's a hospital. And they just announced it. I was there at the presser where they made the big announcement at a local high school. Their focus is on mental health, especially for youth, which is in that is really good because we have high suicide rates among young people now. But the fan base, their supporter group, is a very extreme left-wing organization. They're there at the games to, as they say on their page, support the fan, the boys but also, and why use the term boys? Isn't that, anyway, but also. I don't even, I don't know what a boy is. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> but also to perpetuate their social agenda. So they have signs that say support trans youth and Antifa flags and such. And that's just okay. And the front office well, makes accommodations for them. And now 1% or $1 of every sale for their section will go to kill babies for abortion. So there's that. Um, and now that Providence is a sponsor, they've come unglued. They demand their removal because they say they haven't supported trans kids. They have been involved in a lawsuit that didn't, ha didn't meet the quota for helping poor people. Those things are real. I get the helping poor people thing, the trans thing. It's a weird place because what are you, you don't, you want them to do genital mutilation. What's going on here? But just to set this up before I get your comments and we face off on this, they had Xbox and they promote violence in their video games. They've had Zoo Lily, which is a clothing company that gets clothes from China. It just seems like selective outrage to me. But in the end, can we just get back to the sport? Why does it have to be political? Even the Sounders, who, if you want to get a job with them, they say those who are not socially on our the same page need not apply. 
So, geez, guys, let's face off on what's really going on in, in the world and why it has to leak into every area, including sports, Dell. Yeah, it's become a, it is becoming a more and more issue and the old verbiage is money talks and it does because the, these folks feel if they sponsor, they can, they, they bought their way into things. And then the teams and the organizations sometimes need the money, but I almost to the point where I think we just get rid of all the, all sponsors, especially at that age group, but they wouldn't survive. If not, they'd be doing bake sales and car washes. again. <laughs> it, I think there needs to be some type of a stipulation because you can look into the money that I invest in. I'm sure there's somewhere some some is going to some company i don't really agree with but i don't know all that i think at one point you just have to say we're going to you can be a sponsor we'll put your name up but that's as far as it goes okay. but it's got to have people have backbone to say that and, and i don't think it will brent yeah i think it's just reflective of the trends we see in society of, of like these ideological purity tests that we impose on people yeah. uh, if i'm going to do business with you you have to hold this social or political position. And there was a song, a line from an old song years ago, but it was like, what are you gonna only buy milk from Christian cows? We as Christians are certainly guilty of this as well. As far as politics and sports, I know we, we've talked about it a lot. And it's, I don't think you're gonna get it out of there, but as sponsorships really drive a lot of what's going on now, all the ball games are named after sponsors, the money that flows into the professional leagues from their sponsorships really has more to do with the prosperity of the leagues than even like ticket sales. There's a lot of money involved. And so you're going to get all of these other battles that are just a reflection of yeah. the larger picture. It's what's going on in our, not just our country, but our world. Yeah. My, well. and my issue with this, I, I think it's great for people to say, Hey, I have a concern here. It brings sunlight. So in that, I applaud yeah. the supporters and the, and the Alliance and the supporters group at ECS. But while you're having this conversation and it's making news, what I really ask is that when you get into the stadium, let's let it be about supporting the team outside and in the press right yeah. now, go ahead and say, Hey, wait a minute. You know, this, we don't like their practices. Okay. But when you get in the stadium, shut up yeah. and scream for your team. <laughs> well, you saw the results over the last several years when Kaepernick started this movement of, of kneeling. You don't see that anymore because hmm. money sponsors pulled out. Sponsors told the league, we're going to stop if this stuff keeps going on. So there has not, to my knowledge, I don't know of one player who's kneeled this year, except whenever, when DeMar Hamlin was lying on the field, everybody kneeled then, Ooh. which was fantastic. Yeah, and that was, yeah, they were kneeling in actual prayer. Yes. Talk um, about the God story. Yeah, yeah. but... Yeah, I was just going to say that also showed, obviously now people will be talking and there'll be more conflict over the whole DeMar Hamlin mm -hmm. story. But in the moment, all the political crap, every all that stuff was out the window. Everything yeah. is, was focused on his well-being. And it'd be nice, it's human nature, but it'd be nice if it didn't take a near tragedy to bring us together like that. Yeah, for those of us who lived through 9-11, the, the, the churches were full. People were kneeling weeks. then. And then a few <laughs> weeks later, it started getting political again. I guess that's the call before we get to our final shot of what's the God story in your life? What is your worldview and how does it line up on the field and off the field? And what are the most important things? What are your priorities? Where does God fit in? And if you have a worldview that is in line with a biblical worldview, things really do fall in place. Now, you don't always get things right, but when you adhere to it, look how things fall in place. More people have more rights. There's more love and acceptance. Even if you're on another side of biblical views, you're loved. You're accepted. It's God's job to change you. Things just line up. So that's where I'm just encouraging you. What team are you playing on? It is time, gentlemen, for our final shot. Brent, you got your last shot. What's your final shot? I am actually going to go with <clears throat> Seattle Seahawks general manager, John Schneider, because I think he was unjustly not included in the NFL executive of the year finalists. This was a team that 
at the end of last year, everybody was looking to this year and this, like most people said they were going to win five or fewer games. They traded away Russell Wilson. People were saying, how can you trade away your franchise quarterback? They didn't sign a guy like Baker Mayfield or Jimmy Garoppolo. What, you're going to go with Geno Smith? They did and had probably one of the top two NFL rookie draft classes this past year, yeah. made the playoffs. To me, there's no way he should not be a, at least a finalist on that list. Because it I, is I, more I even than say, just the star of the quarterback. It's the team. It's the love your brother. Yep. It's how you execute. And you've got guys, finalists that are for, on <laughs> both sides of the ball for rookie of the year. Whether they win or not, I am a firm believer in the New York bias, so I don't think they're going to win. But <laughs> I'm going to give it to John Schneider for, you know, not listening to the outside noise and just say, this is our plan, this is what we're going to do, and then pulling it off and... Now the future looks pretty bright. Uh, what I thought your final shot was going to be, a certain ball player that took down a mountain lion. <sighs> <laughs> he said that, that story to me, Brent. Do you want to share that? That's crazy. Oh, man. Yeah. What was that guy's name? Um, I'm trying oh, to remember dude. because you, you said Derek, Derek Wolf. Oh, yeah. So there was Derek Wolf was Derek the guy's Wolf. name. Okay. He doesn't play anymore. He played with the Broncos when they won the Super Bowl. But yeah, he uh, there was a mountain lion that was terrorizing the area where he lives, his neighborhood. It's all right. I got this. <laughs> he tracked it into the mountains, like almost to 10,000 feet and took it down with a bow and arrow. That's crazy. <laughs> That's crazy. All right. There you go. Dell, final shot. What was that guy's name? Derek Wolf. My shot is Derek Wolf. Now, my actually, my mine's a little different. I hadn't thought of it until just a couple of minutes ago. But in, when we were in Buffalo, we got there early, like I said, about ten o'clock, and then we went in the booth, went upstairs, and started talk, talking to the one of the one of the guides. Their name's Kevin, and he. I said, and there was nothing going on. They hadn't even brought the food out yet. So he, I said, hey, I'd like to see this place because Buffalo's complex is impressive. And the overall feel, the state, even though they get a new stadium, the stadium's awesome. The press box is awesome, but their whole complex, like a compound, is really re remarkable. So he took me to some places in the stadium, gave me a little tour of the stadium before people got in and saw some of the nice suites that are, that are up there. And it's really nice suites, but then we both sat down and did some brisket. But so my shout out, my shot goes out to Kevin. Kevin did a great job. As a, uh, <laughs> I think my shout out goes out to the brisket, but yeah. uh, I'm going to shout out to the Seattle Kraken. Hockey is not as amazingly popular in the States as it is up in Canada. And this NHL team, the 32nd team, it gets almost no press. They broke an NHL record. You know how it's been 100 plus years of the NHL. And they broke a record a couple of weeks ago of the most wins, a consecutive uh, road trip win, seven. And that was pretty cool. And they, that appeared in our local paper in like a small print somewhere. The Seahawks, who they I mean, they're already done for the season, are still on the front page. So I want to give them a little press because they're only two years new. And they're sitting first in the division, eighth in the league and it is it's pretty exciting so i'm my seattle kraken i just given it to you and to my boys it is so good to see you i know for dell during football season it's yeah. certainly hit and miss because sometimes you got to travel and it's just really awesome when we get to see you another shout out to both of you have exciting books that i'll put links to at my michelle live because you both write the god story and you do it in different ways, but Some you're making ball. a difference. And I just, yeah. I love you guys. Thank you for being here today. And God bless you. Good. Thank and you. Go ahead, Del. Good up to your book. Is it out or coming out? It's almost out. It's called yeah. Find Your Voice. And we're just weeks away. It's a book that encourages you to find the superpower communication that you may not know you have and get that message that God has inside of you, however it's supposed to come out. So we'll talk more about that. Thank you for mentioning it. I'm so excited. I'm off to, I'm off to Kansas City. <laughs> All, right, All right. Kansas fun, City. Bill. Kansas <laughs> City. Here I come. <laughs> Enjoy some barbecue. Yeah, oh, really? there you go. Thanks, guys. God bless you. Like us, share right. us, and subscribe. God bless. For more fun, go to MyMichelleLive.com. All right. We'll be rooting for you, Dell.